Welcome to the Money to the Masses podcast, putting you in control of your finances. It's a good thing podcasts are free, as this one isn't worth a penny. Here are your hosts, Damian Fay and Andy Leakes. Now, Damien, before we get on with this week's podcast, you had something quickly to say about our sponsors. Yeah, we've got a new sponsor, Money Farm, and Money Farm are an online investment advisor and one of the biggest digital wealth management companies in Europe. So a big thank you to them for sponsoring the podcast. Now, Money Farm create portfolios to maximise long-term returns using ETFs to make incredibly cheap portfolios. And you even get the first £10,000 of your portfolio invested without any charge from Money Farm. And if you enter the code MTTM20K into the box when you sign up, you get the first £20,000 of your portfolio invested and run by moneyfarm.com without any charge. Great stuff. On with this week's show. Hello and welcome to episode 113 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? You feeling festive? I am feeling festive because this week I attended my daughter's nativity play. Ah, oh, there we go. And so you, you, you can't help but feel festive when you've watched a nativity play with all the comedy, the unintended comedy that goes on in a uh, nativity play for sort of Five to seven-year-olds, I think, was the age range of this particular play. So there's so much uh, almost slapstick comedy going on without it meaning to be um, intentional. So, yeah, brilliant. So I am now feeling more festive than I was. What about you? Yeah, absolutely the same. I've been um, fully nativityed out this week because I've also had my <laughs> daughter who was, um, who was doing her nativity. A couple, they do a couple of different shows. And also my children have been watching the film Nativity on the various sort of streaming devices. We've got Netflix and Amazon Prime. And I think Nativity, the original is on one of them and Nativity 3 is on the other one. And so we had to, of course, buy Nativity 2 because that was the one missing from the set. So... Yeah, a week's worth of nativity. It's uh, yeah, it's all very, uh, <laughs> it's all a bit much actually. Oh, good. I'm feeling festive, and so so are you. But um, I suppose we best crack on with the money stuff, haven't we? Because I've put a lot into the show again. I've crammed it. We're not just because it's Christmas. We're not taking it easy, Andy. So uh, um, we've got a lot of money stuff. So your next question is going to be, Damien, what's on the show? <laughs> so Damien, I'm glad you've um, glad you brought that up. Um, so what, what's on the show? Right, this week, we've got a couple of uh, giving-type themes. We've got a um, slight Christmas angle to it, but it's actually got a more uh, evergreen feel in terms of investing as gifts for children. So there are a lot of people who want to give gifts to children, but they might want to be uh, do something that's going to be longer. Uh, so they might actually want to give them something for their future. So grandparents, they're a good example of this. They might want to save or invest some money for their kids so i'm actually going to talk about that how can you do it what are the best things to do because it is one of those areas it's a slightly unusual thing but um there are plenty of people out there and there's some it's quite you don't have to put away a lot of money so i'm going to talk about that i'm going to talk about the cost of financial advice and given that we're heading towards the end of a year and into a new one then normally people look at their finances and think do you know what i'm going to sort these out once and for all. And that may mean getting help. So it's actually looking at what the cost of advice is, but with a sort of slightly backward looking, because we're going to look at how it's evolved over the last few years so people can actually see what the cost of advice is, how it's changed, and actually, in some cases, how they're being slightly, well, quite quite a bit overcharged. So that's one of them. We've got a, another bit about gifts. One thing, um, if you've got presents you've bought, uh, listen out for the tip of something not to do. And the final thing, I don't know why I've crammed four in this week, but something to do with pay and about how much you get paid and uh, gender gaps. So I want to talk about that very briefly. Okay, you're not going to be controversial on that, are you? No, no. The point is that there is a gender gap. And so we're going to show people how they can find out what the gender gap is in payments across all sorts of jobs. So we need to bring this, we need to shine a light on the uh, gender pay gap that still exists and I'm going to show people how. And also, inadvertently, they can actually check whether they're personally man or woman. Are they getting paid a, a reasonable amount for their for their role, their job? Good. OK, so Christmas investments, Christmas as a gift for uh, for relatives and things like that. You mentioned that at the start. Should we do that first? Yeah, let's go with that, Andy. Right, this story, as many, I seem to start lots of these things at, 
a journalist asked me, and this is another one of those stories, a, a national newspaper journalist asked me, what are the best ways to invest for children as a gift so you can give an investment? Now, we're setting aside the idea of opening savings accounts or anything like that. That's a little bit more um, tedious and mundane. Some people might actually want to do something that could grow a bit faster than things with a very low interest rate. So I'm going to rattle through them but they are with their pros and cons. And the first one is National Savings and Investments Children's Bonds. So NS&I Children's Bonds. So these are the step up from normal children's savings accounts. So what you can do is you can put in £25 a month up to a total of £3,000. And the children will get 2.5% tax free which is which is obviously good and they're backed by government because one of the things if you're going to do any kind of investing whether it's saving or investing these are more towards the end of saving but if you're going to do something where you're locking your money away for for a child then you want to make sure that the people or the institution that offer it are still going to be around so ns and the, ns and i are backed by the government so you can guarantee that by the time you finish or your child or grandchild actually has access to these things that the that the, the money will still be there so the children's bond from sn and i oh God, I'll tell you what, i struggle with that one andy ns and i backed by government two and a half percent tax free the one negative i would say or two really there's a five-year term on these things so if you do want to take one of these out you're going to have to they can't get access to it for five years so it does mean you have to get a parent to manage them for you and they can be opened by parents, guardians, grandparents, or even great-grandparents. So you could open them for your grandchildren if you wanted to. But because of the term that's involved, at some point, somebody's going to have to do something with it at the end of the five years. So you're going to have to tell the parents. So it's not quite the surprise, if you get what I mean, if you're given a gift. So it doesn't have to be Christmas. This is all year round I'm talking about. The other one to think about, this is really popular, actually. We were fortunate enough that one of my children one of the grandparents did this for them which is premium bonds and premium bonds as you may know are you can put a minimum of a hundred pounding and it's a month, monthly prize draw isn't it yeah so you have a you have a premium bonds and you get put in a, a prize pool of everybody else all the millions and millions of other premium bond holders and if your numbers come out then you could win up to a million pound now the way they work is you don't actually earn any money on them they just stay there. You get entered every month. So, um, so ad infinitum, you just keep going. But they give you, they quote a return on these things of 1.25% tax free. And the idea is that if you pull together all the winnings of everybody in the UK and put that against the amount of money that's in there, that works out to be 1.25%. So, of course, there are many people who've held these things for 40 years or something and they've never won anything yet there'll be somebody who's had one for a week and may have won a million pound or some of the smaller prizes so you just don't know but what they're quite good for and why they're popular is because again they're they're backed by government so always going to be around there's no management of them so if a grandparent or anybody wanted to buy them then you don't need the parents input so you could just go and uh, put a hundred pound put it in the child's name and it's just left there forever. And they can eventually, when they're older, they can decide to cash it in or whatever. But of course, there's the possibility that they could end up being a millionaire from it. So it's I always put it into the realm of not a incredibly serious long-term investment because inflation is going to erode that, isn't it? Because chances are you're not going to make a lot of money, but they could do. It's a bit better than buying a lottery ticket because they actually have something that stays there forever. Unlike a lottery, you're only in it for one week. So... That's the next step up from we went from ch from savings to children's bond to premium bonds where you're starting to get towards the element of some more. There's not much risk, but there's actually a little bit more potential upside. Then the next one is two more. So hang on, there's two more friendly societies. Now, friendly societies are much like building societies that they're owned by their members, but they the real difference is that they've just been around for a hell of a lot longer. Some of these are hundreds of years old. And what they do is they offer a version of like a children's bond, but it's actually got an investment element to it. Okay. So there's something like there's a fund that will invest in. Um, it will have cash. It will have property. It will have bonds. It might have equity, so shares in there. And you don't have to do anything. There's just one fund, and they will call it a with profits fund. And I won't dwell on it, but the way they work is that they rather than get the return that you 
wood from those assets every year into the investment. They smooth it out, so they keep back some of it. So what's happened in the past, they, premium with profits funds have had a bit of a bad name because they don't always deliver those great returns. So on the scale of investments, it's a good way of dipping the toe into something that's very managed and the returns are smoothed out. But you're not going to... Um, set the world alight or shoot the stars with that kind of uh, investment but you will probably have a good upside so this is their now investment so there is a risk that the return you get back could be less than you put in right so the positive is I've, okay they're not backed by government but these institutions have been around for a long time so there's a an evidence that they will still be around more than likely when your children are older or your grandchildren now you can do this from as little as 10 pound a month that's a real positive of them the downside is that you have to commit to doing it for about 10 years right? because they are a 10-year term. So that's a, that's quite a long time. And if you stop paying for whatever reason, then they could potentially keep all the money and the child gets nothing. So that's part of the contract. So they, again, these are the next step up in investing. And ultimately, if you really want to do something where you're gifting money to a child to invest because you don't want them to have it, then those were the first three the last one and by far the best is still going to be a, a junior isa now we do a lot on the site about analyzing on money to the masses.com analyzing the best junior isas out there so if you just google the best uh, stocks and shares junior isas you'll find us or you could just go on the site and look at it now the these can only be opened by parents or guardians so if you're a grandparent or somebody some other family member who wants to put money in one of these you have to check that one exists because if they don't exist, then you can't open one for the child that you want to make the gift for. So you're going to have to get the parent involved. Now, again, these these are tax-free returns. And you get an amazing investment choice. You get the same investment choice if you had a pension or investments yourself. There's a maximum of £4,080 at the moment a year that can be contributed in total by everyone. So they are the best ways to start investing for children unless you want to go and start saving this that's to me is the sliding scale when you get into somewhere where you can do um start giving them uh, investment risk and build a pot of money for their future but as if you go back through them each has their positive and negative some for some people it will be the fact that they don't have to involve the parents they might not even get on with the parents for other people some have uh, some of those have low minimums which is actually more accessible to them than some of the others that require you to put in more money so have a re-listen to all of that and then you pick the one that you want. Good stuff. And um, you often hear this phrase banded about, about gifts that keep on giving. You know, in a weird kind of a way, the, these are gifts that keep on giving because uh, there's an investment element to them. So, yeah, nice. I like that. I mean, I I like the idea because of that, that you're saying, Andy, that you, you do get, it's not being ungrateful, but some people... If you've got children, they can get a lot of presents from lots of family members. And sometimes it's quite nice to have that sort of thing going on in the background. And we've had family members, when children are born, for example, want to put money towards something. Only a small amount of money towards their future. And I like that idea. So it all works for the same as that. If people want to give gifts, there are ways that they can do, which doesn't have to directly involve the parents as such, but can give them some investment risk. Good. That's it. It's done. Beautiful. What we got next? Right. Let's go with a very quick piece it's almost just a point i want to raise to people out there to do with presents at christmas where they hide presents okay there's a money related aspect to this i don't know about you andy but when i was a kid i remember going around and hunting for presents we're at that cusp of whether our daughter believes in father christmas or not and we've always got that little rogue in school who's going around telling people not only where babies come from, but also where, um, where that Father Christmas doesn't exist. So we're, we're at that cusp where you definitely have to make sure that you hide the presents in the house because there might be prying eyes that ruin the whole thing because obviously she still believes in Father Christmas. So, because he does exist for anyone out there who's questioning it themselves. But I don't know about you, but we used to always hide, my mum and dad used to hide theirs in the in the wardrobes. <laughs> so we used, to just go, we used to just go around as kids looking in wardrobes so you, you have to come up with ever and ever more inventive places to hide presents so i don't know where your parents kept them or where you keep yours for your for your kids well you've already mentioned it mine were always in the wardrobes and as are currently in the wardrobes <laughs> yeah but do you know one of the one of the, there's a piece of research that has been carried out and 72 percent of people will hide presents in their car 
because they think their wife maybe it'd be a bit a piece of jewelry jewelry or something or a ring or watch so expensive things they will actually hide it in the car so it's not in the house so they can't find it and the quick point i wanted to make is that that's an incredibly bad idea because it's very unlikely they're going to be covered if you by your car insurance if you get broken into so you have to bear in mind if you're going to put expensive gifts in there and someone breaks in and steals that gift it might not be covered on your car insurance unlikely to be because normally they have quite low uh, thresholds for value so sometimes only about 100 200 pounds and of course it's whether it's been lost outside of your house whether your house insurance has something that would cover you as well so just bear that in mind if you're going to put something expensive in the car to hide it from your wife or oh, before i wrap up that piece there's something that's always baffled me is um push chairs i know lots of people put push chairs and buggies in their car and leave them in the boot and do you remember a few podcasts ago quite a while ago now probably about six months i joked about how the buggy in the back boot of the car was worth more than the car and we found out when we were trying to get rid of the car because it's basically falling apart when the man party exchanged and he just told me that yeah pretty much the he'd almost rather have the push chair out <laughs> the back and the push chair was seven years old itself because it was for our first daughter we'd used it so um that just goes to show you that the value of some of the things you put in your car might actually be higher than the excesses and the level of cover on your policy right next piece andy the cost of advice mm. yeah interesting this one okay shoot right what, what i'm doing with this one is people in a new year or any time might decide they want to sort their finances out and might want to go and see a financial advisor and one of the biggest things people um stops them is the cost of that advice and that whether it's worth worth it so let's just just park with the whether it's worth it for now and whether you need to we're going to just talk about the cost because if you've already gone and spoken to them you probably might need to we're assuming you know you need advice and the chances are you need advice if you can't do something yourself or don't have the confidence so how much does it cost now again there's been some research that's looked at the change in the the landscape of how financial advisors charge for advice and it's very difficult for consumers to know what is the average and what's a good rate and what's not a good rate because advisors don't really compare there's no league tables out there so what's happened is in 2013 i don't know if anyone remembered but it was something called rdr retail distribution review in very very simple terms what it did is it stopped financial advisors and fund houses well it actually changed the way they were paid. So in the past, fund if you bought an investment and it was a, an investment fund, it would be all bundled up in the cost of about 2.5% would come out of your investment every year and then that would be divvied up to people. And some of that would go to the, the investment platform they were used, so that's the, the mechanism by which they buy the fund. The it would, Some would go to the advisor who'd recommended the fund, the fund house would keep some. So what it meant is that people didn't really know who was getting paid what and it just seemed... It was, it, was very, it was very opaque and not very clear. So the FCA quite rightly said, look, we don't like any of this. We wanted to make it very clear. And of course, that makes things have to be cost um, effective and competitive because once people know exactly what you're charging, they will then say, well, hold on. If I'm, you're giving me advice and it's costing me a certain amount every year, well, what am I getting for that? Because before it was always just, it was just bundled into it and it was almost part of the deal. Everyone did it. So since then, the idea was that it would almost make it far more transparent so if you went and bought an investment or went to see an advisor he may charge you a certain amount up front and an ongoing commission at the back end so that was typically about half a percent so if you had a hundred thousand pounds investment then they would charge you 500 pounds would go to the advisor other amounts would go to other people up to a total of maybe between a thousand and two thousand pounds maybe and some of those would go to the fund house and the, and the platform. But it, made, it was meant to make it clear. And of course, the idea was that it was meant to open up financial advice to everyone. Now, people fairly, fairly early on saw the, the problem was that if an advisor has to demonstrate it's in his value, he's going to push up his costs. And it would actually create this thing called an advice gap, which means that ordinary people couldn't afford advice. And that's kind of, that's us, Andy. And that's where Money to the Masses originally came from, actually, because of that gap. I could see it was happening. This was in 2010. It was it was in the pipeline. And just that idea that most people don't have financial advice. So that's why I started doing this podcast and doing Money to the Masses, which came first, like I said, in 2010. Now, the interesting thing that 
about this research. What it's found is there are two trends. The cost of financial advice has gone up by 50%. And actually, financial advisors, one-fifth of financial advisors have actually asked clients to leave and ditch, and they've ditched them because, because, because you're not profitable, because you're not big enough. Now, this is, shows you, back in 2014, it was deemed that £25,000 was the minimum by which someone would take you seriously as a financial advisor. They would say, if you've got £25,000 and I could do something with you and it's worth my time and money. They might not have said those words, but that's what they would have, that's why their minimum of, oh, £25,000 to invest was there understandable everyone's got to make some money you're not going to do it for free well two years later so 2016 the minimum now on average typically is a hundred thousand pounds now that's a large sum of money for people to have a hundred thousand pound for a lot of ifas to deem it worthwhile to engage with you now, of course there are people who do it for lower sums i'm not saying that they don't exist but they're harder to find and the just to show you the the difference um, as well, it's not just about the, like I say, the the minimums and whether they take you seriously. They the costs, like I said, had jumped up, and I'm talking about on the back end. So when they when you go to an financial advisor, they'll charge an amount up front, which is normally a sort of a fairly hefty sum, and then something on the back end. Now I'm going to just focus on the back end bit at the moment. Like I said, that used to be around half a percent was his share. Now they looked at the numbers, and actually that's jumped fifty percent. So therefore, typically now. Financial advisors charge three quarters of a percent. Mm. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. Because bearing in mind if you're investing in anything, that means that your starting point, you've got to get at least 1% a year just to stand still. And that's just his cut. If you've got to then pay the fund managers and the platforms and all those people, you're going to have to get uh, 2 3% just to break even. So that's why people go here alone and do DIY investing. And if you're interested in that, then have a look at 80-20 investor. Um, which is my DIY investment service, where I just teach people how to run their own money, uh, which has been hugely successful, and um, we'll talk about more in future podcasts as well. Um, so, yeah, just to run through, 24% of financial advisors charge 1% a year, just even if they don't do anything for you. That's, they're meant to give you a service, but some of them hide from it. 28% charge half a percent, 45% charge three quarters of a percent, and a very small number five percent charge over one percent a year that's a lot of money bearing in mind if you had a hundred grand if they were charging you one percent that's one thousand pounds for not even doing anything even if they didn't get out of bed they're supposed to do something that's your job to say what is it you do so that is the ballpark you're looking at i personally wouldn't pay more than half a percent for a financial advisor i'd argue it these are negotiable they're not set in stone if they don't want to deal with you then fine they'll find someone else but i wouldn't pay more than that on on an oncurring um, basis unless they gave me very very clear uh, list of what I was getting for that in terms of regular reviews ongoing service phone calls all this sort of stuff and and when it comes to upfront fees then that's quite interesting because what happened from RDRs advisors used to charge percentage fees so you would go back to that hundred grand they might charge three percent up front so three grand quite a bit of money now that's changed, so what they do is they have to charge you an annual fee, and that annual fee, most of them have gone to, is just a reflection of what they were charging up front. So, sorry, not an annual fee, they charge you an upfront fee. So that fee would just be, rather than saying I'm charging you 3% of whatever you invest, they'll just say, well, I'm charging you £3,000. So I don't know why the regulators thought that people wouldn't just use that mentality and um, nothing's really changed. All that's happened is that financial advice has got gotten more expensive and it's become more selective mm. and elitist. So there's not much you can do about that. The one thing I would say is obviously get a recommendation if you want a financial advisor. You can try and do it yourself. Go on unbiased.co.uk. They have a, a good means of you shopping around and looking at for financial advisors. They don't show the costs of them, but they show you people near you you can also find that tool via money to the masses.com if you go on there and just click on find an advisor it, it's there and you can put in your postcode and have a look around but they say if you have ten thousand pounds this is unbiased then the net benefit of advice paying for it the net benefit of paying for it is actually positive and i slightly question that i think it's more i wouldn't actually pay for advice unless i had at least 50 to 100 grand anyway because yeah i mean i'm that slightly uh, I know I talk about money and everything like that, but I'm just if I was talking to somebody else, if they really didn't know anything, then yeah, I, I understand that. 
then speak to an advisor if you've got less than 50,000. But you'd really have to drive down the costs and be very specific about what they do. So there you go, Andy. That's the bit on cost. The only thing I would say is I think going forward what we'll see is a lot of consolidation and lots of people merging because if they can't keep their drive their costs down, if they can't make more money from people, they have to drive the costs down. And the way they do that is consolidation. And I do think, as a very passing comment, as an industry, I think when they do consolidate, whether it's firms, wealth managers, whatever it is, I'm not sure they actually look at it from the client's point of view, whether it's good. They always look at it from whether it's good from the advisor who's buying the new firm. It's from their point of view in terms of income. But anyway, that's just the last passing point on that one. So advice is expensive. That's how much you should pay. Don't pay over the odds. And if you have a query, you can email me and I'll tell you whether I think it's actually worthwhile or not. Good. And there's not many other podcasts or money experts that will uh, invite such a thing. Brilliant stuff, Damien. We've got Battle of the Sexes coming up. You're going to be uh, non-controversial by um, by telling the listeners um, a bit more about it. Well, yeah, this is, again, like I said, I'm not going to be controversial at all. It's just really shining a light on the fact that women are generally underpaid. There's a pay gap, even though that idea was meant to, by law, was meant to have been re- removed Years and years ago, it still exists. And the average, for across industries and across jobs, the average gap between men and women is 18%, one eight. And that's, that's huge. That's almost a fifth. So a pay gap, I mean, in this day and age, that's disgraceful. Women listening to this podcast will be probably screaming or tutting and saying, oh, finally, the, the men have worked this out because they've probably known this all along. There are anomalies. There are odd jobs where women do get paid more, for example. I think there was, um, I think the traffic wardens was a bizarre example. But if you want to go and check what the pay gap is on your particular job, you can, because this work was carried out by the Office of National Statistics, which is the governmental official body that they use to do all the economic analysis out there. So they, if you Google at the ONS and you put the pay gap, there was a URL, it's incredibly long, we might link to it in the podcast notes, you can go on there and just select your job and you can see how it compares to other jobs and what the pay gap is and it's because it has it for men and women. Why would the ONS be publishing this? Is this empowering people to um, challenge it essentially? Well yeah I think it's to empower it but they also need to, as as governments need to know this information anyway because if they're making policies and there's meant to be laws stopping this because what came out um, very recently was about the lack of women in top jobs, so CEOs in FTSE 100 companies and so the idea that they this glass ceiling is meant to have been removed is is flawed because it hasn't been and the only way you can ever find whether it has or whether there's been a change is to go out there and find all the stats and they've just released it which I I applaud them I think it's great that you can uh, see all these figures and the if you're a man listen to this then you should take that on board if, especially if you're an employer because I don't see why men and women don't get paid the same like most people out there would agree with that statement they should be paid the same but if you, even if you're not interested in this and you're going to bury your head in the sand, what that does actually, if you go to the to that calculator, it's an interactive tool. You can see what the hourly rate is on average for your job, which as a an aside is quite an interesting thing. So if you are a you work in finance or you're a train driver, I actually put train drivers in because obviously they're striking all the time at the moment. I wanted to see how much they earn, and it was it was over forty grand a year, forty thousand pounds. So way 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 above the national average probably heading towards almost twice the national average and there was there was really no difference between men and women in that role which was good they were probably overpaid in my view especially they don't seem to go to work anyway <laughs> there we go andy i was controversial at the end <laughs> yeah, you were. and uh yeah i mean it's nice to see that there are there are quite high profile things happening in the press in terms of sports and and equalizing the pay i think it happened with wimbledon quite recently in the tennis um, and I think that's got to filter down to, to the, the general public. So, yeah, good to see. Let's hope that that gap not only just sort of comes a little closer. Let's hope that that gap closes in the next few years. Do you think we'll maybe get to a point in, in, the, in the near future, maybe in our working life, where that gap has completely diminished? Do you know what, Andy? I, I, as a dad of two daughters, and you're the same. I am. You've yeah. got two daughters. I'd love to think it will happen in my lifetime, I think it might happen in their lifetime, but I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm not convinced. I'd love to sit there and think it will close a lot quicker, but the problem is the people in power 
um, in in within businesses have predominantly been men. There are more and more women coming through, so it will change eventually. And I th- and I think it's fantastic that we've got a female prime minister. I think it's fantastic the most one probably the most important woman in the whole of Europe, which is Angela Merkel, is also obviously a woman. And um, it's just a shame Donald Trump runs America. Yeah, yeah. But in the long run, I think it's two steps be forward, one step back. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have female role models, so I hope it does. I just unfortunately the only thing is it has to be driven by men as well. I don't believe this is my sort of final thought on it in a very Jerry Jerry Springer style. Is I think it has to be driven by men as well as it, in the equality stakes because obviously women will want to fight their corner, but wages are a very difficult thing to talk about because people don't, especially in the UK, we don't talk about how much we earn, do we? Mm. It's all very secretive, and some other countries are much more open about what they have and what they in the UK we don't but I think men should I think men should be driving for equality if it's equality with their with their peers who they know get paid less than them and that's a very hard thing to do and if you're an employer I think it should be um, you should drive to be equal pay that's the least I think you could do brilliant okay so get in touch in the usual way if you want to you can contact Damien at podcast at money to the masses.com or you can email him directly Damien at money to the masses.com and he's on Twitter as well at money to the masses with a number two. Yeah, also go and check out the videos Ask Damien Fay on Facebook and YouTube, which are getting a lot of attention, which is me answering reader questions, uh, or viewer questions, listener questions, whatever you want to call them, in two minutes with a hip hop overlay, <laughs> which is, <laughs> it is, we laugh, but that's what it is, which is very fun to do, and um, I think that's why people enjoy it, because it is just a bit different. And it may be getting near Christmas, but Andy and I don't ever... Well, I never give Andy a break, I think, is, is <laughs> in fairness. And we're going to be doing another podcast before Christmas. So even though there's a week to go, you will hear uh, us again. It'll be out on Christmas Eve, actually, a day earlier than normal. And then that will be the last one for this year. So make sure you listen out for that. Please keep spreading the word. We're getting lots of positive feedback about the podcast and what we're doing and everything with money to the masses and uh, yeah until next week andy yes indeed yeah until next time don't forget to claim your free copy of damien's best-selling book the 30-day money plan sort your finances in just five minutes a day worth 4.99 just go to money to the masses.com slash podcast to find out how 